I'd like to take you to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse uh, 1. We're going to read verse 1 all the way to verse 11. I'm not mistaken. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Let's read together. It was now two days before the Passover celebration and the festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and put him to death. But not during the Passover, they agreed, or there will be a riot. Meanwhile, verse 3, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had leprosy. During supper, a woman came in with a beautiful jar of expensive perfume, an alabaster box, an alabaster jar. She broke the seal and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why was this expensive perfume wasted, they asked. She could have sold it for a small fortune and given the money to the poor, and they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why berate her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to. But I will not be here with you much longer. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I assure you, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be talked about in her memory. Last two verses. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. The leading priests were delighted when they heard why he had come and they promised him a reward. So he began looking for the right time and place to betray Jesus. Would you bow your heads? Let's close our eyes. Say a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that even before we have come, you are already here. It is your presence that has welcomed us here. So this is your space. This is your time. We are your people, and this is your word. This is your work, oh Lord God. So would you walk across this room, Lord, and bless your people today with life. We are hungry for life. We are thirsty for life, oh Lord God. So open our ears that we may hear words of life that proceeds from your very lips. Open our eyes that we may see a revelation of you. Oh God, we want to see you for who you are as the word reveals to us, oh Lord God. And Lord, would you open our hearts so we may receive this life that you offer. And Lord, anoint our hands and feet that we may humbly and faithfully obey, oh Lord God, this life path, Lord, that you are directing us to. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, everybody say, amen and amen. One more time, give the Lord your best clap offering. <laughs> Praise God. You know, when you read, uh, when you read the gospel of, of Mark, there's uh, such a, um, uh, an, an energy uh, a movement, okay, and it's fast, okay. Uh, the the pace of uh, the gospel of Jesus according to Mark is fast, uh, beginning from chapter one all the way to thirteen, because the point of Mark, the book of Mark, is to bring you to the cross. The passion of Christ and the Calvary, the cross, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, that's the point of the book of Mark. That is the pinnacle of the story. And in the narration of the life of Jesus, uh, Mark chose that when he reached chapter 14, all of a sudden, there's, there's a, uh, a different tone, a different pace. All of a sudden, he would give us details like he's never done before. From beginning from chapter 14 all the way to the last chapter, Mark would give us the important details, at least uh, important to, to him uh, as the writer. And there are three things, uh, you know, we, you can divide chapter 14, uh, at least what we read, uh, verse 1 to 11. You can divide this into three, okay? 
First, uh, you know, the, the opposition uh, against Jesus Christ uh, by the priests, by the Pharisees, by the teachers of the law, the leading priests at that time. And, and the opposition at this point, it's not only to, you know, to smear him, you know, his reputation. It's not only to publicly humiliate him. It's to kill him. Ganun na po sila ng gigigil kay Jesus. Okay? They want to literally take him down. We want to kill this guy. We want to stop him on his tracks. And the way to do that is to get him out of the picture. Kill. Kill this guy. That's the plan. The second part of what we read, verse 1 to 11, is the woman. This, this all of a sudden, this tender part of, of that narration. And then it ends again with the betrayal of Jesus. So, yung book ends po niya, okay, is the priests wanting to kill Jesus, and then Judas agreeing with the priests. Let's go ahead and kill him. I want to betray him. I'm one of his disciples. Let's go ahead and do it. Okay? Those are the book ends. So, I want us to first look at the middle part. This woman, okay? Mark gives us this, um, these details, okay, uh, in this story. Now, he doesn't give us the name of the woman, okay? He doesn't give us uh, where she came from. That's not a, 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 a detail that was given to us. But the most important detail about this woman, Mark gave. At least, if we want to understand the story and really get what this story is telling us, we need to look into the details that the writer gave us about this woman. He, did, he didn't give us the name. He didn't give us where she came from. But he did give us what she brought with her when she gate crashed okay, this party. Jesus was in Bethany, and he was in the house of Simon. A, uh, according to Mark, he had leprosy. So I'm already assuming Jesus healed this leper. And in celebration of the healing, they went to the house of this leper. And now they are breaking bread. They are sharing a meal. There's a party going on in the house of Simon. Now, a woman, an unnamed woman, all of a sudden, gates crashes this, gate crashes this party, okay, enters in, and Mark gives us the most important detail about this woman. It's what she brought with her. And what she did with that thing that she brought with her. According to Mark, this woman, uh, gate crashes uh, this party, brings with her a very expensive item. It's an alabaster jar. And inside that alabaster jar is perfume, oil-based perfume. And Mark gives us another detail, okay, about what she brought. This is very costly, very expensive. How much? In particular, 300 denarii. Now, what is 300 denarii? So that we can, you know, we can wrap our minds around the value of 300 denarii during biblical times. 300 denarii po can feed 5,000 men. That's how much 300 denarii was. At that time, you know, it's like Paul and Mitch's wedding. You know, they invited the entire lighthouse community. They invited the barangay of Mitch, you know, the barangay of Paul, right? They invited the family, the friends of the family, and the acquaintances of the friends, of the friends of the family, you know? 5,000 men in one sit seating you can feed with 300 denarii. And he even broke it down for us, okay, how much, how precious, okay, this alabaster jar and that perfume, oil-based perfume inside it. Ang sabi po dito sa kwento, you can work one, one year, okay, one year. Because a wage during the, those days, okay, a day's wage is one denari. So if you work for a year, okay, then you can get 300 denarii and purchase this alabaster jar. That's how much it is worth. That's how much it is worth. Now, 
she goes in and the story says she breaks the entire thing. Okay? She breaks the entire thing and then she pours all of the content of this jar onto the head of Jesus, anoints him with everything, okay? The, the inside of this jar, everything was poured onto Jesus. Nothing was spared. She lovingly, generously, extravagantly poured it onto Jesus. All of it. That's what Mark says. And then we hear somebody, okay? In, in Mark, he doesn't give us the detail who, you know, who berated this woman, who complained, okay? But in the account of John, John tells us who? It was Judas. Judas, the keeper of the money, the person who would know, you know, the cost. Who would know how much this is, right? And who would know that 300 denarii can feed 5,000 men? That same guy says, Why waste so much money? Why waste so much money? So that's the story so far. And when I read that story, here's my question. My question is... Do you think it would have been the same expression of devotion if it did not involve the amount that we're talking about? Do you think it would have been the same, you know, sacrifice? This woman would bring, you know, uh, something else, something cheaper maybe. I don't know. But my question is, if it did not involve the amount that we're talking about, the cost, okay, that is being uh, told to us about this alabaster jar, if it was not 300 denarii, would it have been the same sacrifice? Now, I asked, I asked a lot of people about this question. You know, I brought this question to, you know, CBN Asia. I brought this question to the Bible study downstairs. I asked... Um, some of the people that I'm close to. And generally, the answer that I get is this. But Pastor Mark, isn't it true that God looks at our hearts? Isn't it true? Yes? Who would agree that God looks at our hearts? Raise your hand. Just a show of hand. God looks at our hearts. Amen? He doesn't look at the amount that we give. Amen? He looks at our hearts. I agree with that, you know, with that thought. I agree with that line of thinking. The only thing is this. When I read this story, balik tarin kuman po yung kwento, there is that detail of the 300 denarii. I cannot disregard that. For some reason, Mark includes it. And whenever something is included, it means it's important. And in this case, it's more important than the name of the woman. It's more important than where she came from. It's more important than how she looked and how she was dressed that day. What was important was what she brought to the table. That's what's important. I cannot disregard the fact that somehow this alabaster jar became the center and even the source of tension in this story. Judas all of a sudden berates the woman, why waste? You know, you could have saved that money and we could have done so much ministry with the poor. That's what he said, right? And as a good Christian, you know, we kind of, I kind of agree, <laughs> you know? And as a good Christian, in the same line as a good Christian, we also think, to answer my question, God doesn't look at the amount of the gift. He looks at the heart. Somebody told me, isn't it true, Pastor Mark, that prior to this chapter 14, you know, the, this woman that went to the temple was talked about. She doesn't have 300 denarii with her. She didn't give like this woman gave. She had like, what, two, two copper coins, two pennies, right? That wasn't much, right? 
But listen to this. If we're going to compare that woman, okay, that widow that went to the temple, okay, just a chapter before uh, chapter 14. This widow goes to the temple and she gave two pennies. This woman that gate crashes, okay, in Simon's house, she gave, you know, this very expensive alabaster box. So if you're going to just compare both of them for, for a while, okay, just think with me. The widow gave out of everything that she had. That's why that story is very important. Now, listen to this. We cannot disregard that in the telling of that story, the two copper coins is a detail that is important. There was a cost involved. Isn't it? And out of what she had, two copper coins, two pennies, everything that she had at the moment, she gave it all. This woman now that gate crashes uh, Simon's house, gate crashes this dinner, she gives out of the best of what she has. So it's true that the heart that they brought was important. But in both cases, there was a cost involved. What does David say? I will not give a sacrifice unto the Lord that does not cost me anything. Somehow the cost is important. Now, would you agree that giving is a personal thing? I really think so. Why? Because money is very personal. Isn't it? Like, I wouldn't, you know, every now and then, you know, uh, Paul and Mitch, you know, we'd, you know, we'd bump into the mall, you know, and then we'd decide, oh, tada, tada, let's, let's go sit down, you know, let's catch up. Or it's a planned thing. Like, we really planned something and we'll, we'll catch up, right? I don't go see my friends, and the moment we sit down, so, how rich are you now? <laughs> you don't ask that, right? That's distasteful. You don't sit with friends to catch up and talk about the money in your pocket. Why? Because the money in your pocket is personal. Isn't it true? You don't ask around for, how much is your salary? If, if, if <laughs> I get you. <laughs> How much is your... You, you don't sit around with friends and talk about salary. Like, I have a discovery group, uh, or I mean a discipleship group. We just met yesterday. So all 13 of us, okay, including uh, May and, and Josh, when, when we talk about, oh, what's your high and, and, and your low, we really don't talk about money. We talk about other things, right? Unless it's voluntarily shared, Right? But even if it's voluntarily shared, wouldn't you agree that every time money is put on the table, it becomes awkward? Like, all of a sudden your mind is like, oh, change subject. <laughs> right? Change subject. Because giving is personal, my friend. It is very personal. So, when the pastor, and, and I'll, share, I'll share with you, you know, my, the, my early Christian experience. When the pastor or whenever an elder stands here, you know, and, and it's funny because, you know, as a, as a, as a new Christian then, you know, it, it really, you know, the, the, it, it conjured, su conjured such emotions, okay? Whenever the, whenever the pastor or the elder would stand and goes, are you ready to give? You know? And then, and then the people would answer, yes. And then the pastor is not, you know, satisfied with that. Mahina, Mahina, are you ready to give? And then the pastor would go, yeah. You know, the congregation goes like that. I, I'm like this, okay? As a new Christian. Are you ready to give? I'm getting my wallet. <sighs> Are you ready to give? And then everybody goes, yeah. And I'm going like, yeah. 
and I'm looking at my wallet, okay? No, seriously, this is my, you know, when I was a new Christian. And I'm looking at my wallet, okay? And, and right now, okay, in my wallet, I have a, I have a ringgit from, <laughs> from a recent travel. And it's not much. It's just one ringgit. Yeah, they have, they have really nice bills. You know, we have to upgrade our bills. Anyway, I have, I have a 50 peso. I have a 20 peso. Okay. I have a... Tumataas naman. I have a 100 peso. <laughs> and I have two 500 bills. Okay. That's how much I have in my wallet right now. Okay. That's the cash that I have in my wallet. So when the pastor stands up and says, Are you ready to give? Ito po si Mark Rosakay at the time when I was a new Christian. And I don't know if you can relate to this, okay? Giving is a personal thing, okay? I go into this awkward mode. I don't know why, but I really do. I go into this awkward mode and I look at my wallet and I go, uh, all of a sudden, I cannot see yellow. Like I'm colorblind. <laughs> Uh, and, and even purple is kind of vague. Like, is that? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> All I can see is red and orange. <laughs> okay? No, because in my head, I'm thinking, oh, but you know, there's lunch later, and I was single then. There's lunch later, and, you know, see, me and Jonathan and Ronald, you know, we're going to go to, to the mall. So I probably would need my two 500s, okay? We're going to go to Alabang Town Center, okay? Uh, and, and we're going to, you know, eat there and probably watch a movie. So I'm, I might need my two 500s. I'm not, I'm not going to give that, okay? And then uh, I see the, the 100, and I'm going, I'm going, yeah, but you know, I kind of need that tomorrow because I don't know how much will be, you know, left out of the, <laughs> the 1,000 I have. I really don't know. So let's just be sure, okay, to, you know, it's wise. It's wise money management. I'm, I'm exercising, you know, wisdom here, okay? I, I'm thinking I might need that 100 bill tomorrow, okay? Because we don't know, okay? We don't know if the 1,000 will last me today. Baka uh, magkaya So now I'm looking at the orange and the two reds, okay? And I'm thinking, ah, okay, maybe the two reds. All right, maybe the two reds. But then I go, wait, if I'm not gonna give the 100, but I'm gonna give the two reds, that doesn't make sense. So just give one red. <laughs> okay, just give one red. So here I am now, I'm marching down and I'm ready to give, you know, and, and, uh, and the pastor goes, are you ready to give? You know, and I shout, ah! <laughs> you know, with my five, 50 peso, right? And I go to the basket, I drop the I drop the red, okay? And then I see an orange. Ooh, change. Thank you, God. The Lord provides in his house. <laughs> okay? That's really my experience. Okay? And there are times when there are times when I felt that the Lord was tugging my heart, okay? About tithing, okay, and about giving. That you know, he would talk to me about the two yellows. And, and, and I tell you, I've had moments, okay, the two yellows are, you know, nicely tucked in my wallet. And the Lord would talk to me about the two yellows, okay. And I'm looking at my wallet and this is, this is how it is or how it was. And going like, and at the background, are you ready to give? You know, and in my head, like, shut up. <laughs> I'm trying to make up my mind here. You know, but ang kulit ng pastor, he will ask the second time, are you ready to give? You know? And I'm like, <laughs> you know? Why is that? Okay, I don't know if you can relate to this, but why is that? I'll tell you why. Because as a good Christian, you and I, the struggle is not in the general principle of obedience. When we are preached about tithes and offering, the struggle is not in the general principle of obedience. I don't think so. 
The struggle is not in the general expectation that now that you are following the Word of God, you need to follow all of God's Word, including that which talks about you giving something of yourself back to God. I don't think the struggle is there. The tension, my friends, is in the amount. That's where the tension is. Because the tie that binds us is not in the principle. The tie that binds us down when it comes to giving is the amount. And therefore, Mark gives us that detail of 300 denarii. Mark says, this is how much it costs this woman. It's important that you and I understand the cost of her worship. It's important that you and I understand the cost of her praise because Mark is telling us something here. When the widow gave two pence, it's important because he wants us to know that that is the best all of the widow can give. And yet, she gave it. This woman, this is the best that she can give. And yet, she gave it to the Lord. The tie that binds us when it comes to giving, because, you know, as a good, I don't think that as a good Christian, you march down church, and in your head, it's just, I'm just going to disobey. You know, that tithe and offering, no. I'm just not going to do that, you know. Because I've, I've heard and I've seen and I've talked to Christians who struggle with tithes and offering. And yet there is that open mind to it. It's the Word of God. You know, I'm just struggling. You know, I, I know I'm going to get there. You know, I have yet to see like somebody who would, no, I'm not going to, right? The tension, my friend, is not in the principle. It's not in the expectation. The tension... My tension is in my 500 pesos. That's where the tension is. That's my issue. That's where I need to be dealt with. Because we tend to lend our passions to the stuff around us, to the stuff that we have accumulated, to the wealth to the possession, to the things that we think we own. That's our attachment. And that attachment sometimes becomes so strong that there are moments, okay? There are moments. As we devote ourselves to Christ, as we obey Christ, as we walk with the Lord, I'm telling you, your devotion to Jesus will bring you to a breaking point. It's just that this woman decided, in this breaking point, let me go ahead and break it all for you. And as I do it, let me offer all to you. Let me pour it unto you. As an expression of my devotion. Your devotion to Christ will be brought to a breaking point, my friend. It will be brought to that place wherein you need to make a decision. And you need to make a choice. Where is my treasure? You know, there's so much freedom for a Christian who, who doesn't have that attachment to the amount anymore. All of a sudden, you don't see yourself as the owner. You see yourself as a steward. That's a totally different perspective, my friend. All of a sudden, God truly is the source. He truly is the owner of everything. And everything that you have now is given to you so that you can steward it. 
so that you can do everything that you can, apply yourself to it in your faithfulness as you walk uh, with the Lord and as you devote yourself to Christ, as you walk this Christianity that we talk about. Lord, all these blessings that you have given to me, let me apply myself to it. And at the end of the day, let me give you back all the glory and all the praise. Why? Because there's no struggle with the amount, however much the amount that we're talking about in this process, in this journey, at the end of the day, everything is to you. So there is so much freedom now in your expression of your devotion. There's so much freedom now in your worship. There's so much freedom now in your praise. It's not anymore, it's time to give. It's time to give. (laughs) It's time to give. Ah! (laughs) It's not like that anymore. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? God loves a cheerful giver. I tell you, if you and I are tied down and we still have our entanglements, you know, Uh, if we are tied down by the amount. We will never reach that condition of the heart wherein we are cheerful. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's amazing to see Christians who, you know, walk their lives and there is such a perspective about the wealth, about the possession, about the stuff. A wise man told me, Mark, you need to not hold it like this. You cannot do it. You'll be so stressed out by 40 years old. Okay? I just turned 39. You know, next year I'm going to, you know, be 40. And this, this man says, you cannot, hold, you cannot hold it like this. Because there's so much. Imagine the stress. <laughs> you know? So I asked him, how do you do it when it comes to, you know, the stuff around me? How do I do it? He says, you hold it like this. This is how you hold it. Whether it's two copper coins or 300 denarii worth of alabaster jar, very expensive, oil-based perfume. How much is Chanel number five? I don't know. (laughs) I think you would know. (laughs) Whatever that is that you hold so dear, that you cling on to, This wise man tells me, you cannot do that. You cannot do that. There's so much stress. You'll be so stressed out. So how do we do it? He says, you have to do it this way. You have to hold it this way. Because when you do, everything is unto the Lord. He touches it and says... I want it. It's yours, Lord. Because it's yours, really. From the onset, it's yours. You hold it like this. It's unto you, God. There's an opportunity to worship the Lord with it. You don't cling to it. You give it to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying give every you know, money that you have okay, to the church, right? I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not preaching, don't be wise with your money. No, go ahead. You know, have some financial plan, okay? We've got so much financial planners here uh, in church. Go talk to one, okay? I'm not saying, go in and invest. Apply yourself. Apply wisdom, right? But don't cling on to it, you know? I, I, love, this, uh, I love this scene in... Um, Lord of the Rings. There's this character there. His name is Gollum, right? His name is Gollum. He clung on to this thing, you know? He says, 
It's our precious. Okay? Precious ring. He clings on to it for dear life. What does that precious thing do to him? It corrupts him. It defiles him. It curses him. The Lord wants you to live a blessed life. And my, I'm here to tell you, this is not a blessed life. This is a blessed life. The Lord may take, but because my hands are open, the Lord is free to give anytime. And He says that if I give unto Him, He will return it to me a hundred times over. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's the promise of the Lord. Because if I think I have given, wow, God, I've given you 1,000 pesos today, that's two yellows. Do you understand that that is two yellow? My friend, you know, the generosity of God, I mean, we, you can't top that. You cannot top that. If I'm going to go one by one here in this room, we're going to fill, you know, the entire day, maybe not even, you know, we're going to need extra more days just to hear out how faithful God is and how generous the Lord has been in our lives. So this tithes and offering, when I say giving is personal, okay, if, if you can still relate to, you know, that thing, you know, that I've gone through, tithes and offering is basically God's way of raising children, because our father doesn't want children like this. He wants children like this. He wants that he has access in your life and everything in your life. He doesn't want that you're a Christian and your wallet is not a Christian. Okay? He wants everything about you following the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you and I are to devote ourselves to the Lord, I'm telling you, we will be brought again and again. This is not just a one-time thing, okay? We will be brought again and again and again. There will be points in our lives wherein it's a breaking point. And the choice is to break unto the Lord this thing that we hold so dear because it is unto you, O God. Now, what does Jesus do to this woman? How does he honor her? What does he say? Whenever, wherever. Whenever, wherever. Meaning, Jesus is being prophetic. He says, until the day that I return. He already knew he's going to resurrect. He already knew he's going to ascend. He already knew that he's going to come back. Until the day I return. Whenever, wherever the gospel is preached. The deed of this woman. Unnamed, we don't know where she came from. But the deed of this woman will be remembered again and again and again and again. Such honor. So, every time, my friend, we are on that breaking point and we choose, all right, God, I'm, just, I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm going to give it to you. It seems to me we catch God's attention. And he honors that expression of devotion. Would you stand with me?